From the Arthur C. Johnson Auditorium at the Ohio Historical Society in Columbus, Ohio, presenting Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, prepared especially for broadcast by Thomas Neely and performed live by the Ohio Historical Society's Museum Theater Company. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. This must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping old sinner. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Now, once upon a time of all good days of the year on Christmas Eve, Old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Bah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that, I'm sure. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own puddin' and buried with a stake of holly through his heart, he should. Uncle! Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good it may do you, much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. Therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. Amen. Let me hear another sound from you and you'll keep Christmas by losing your situation. Nephew, you're quite a powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. I'll never... But why? Why, Uncle? Why did you get married, nephew? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. As if that were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. I am sorry, with all my heart, to find you so resolute. But I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. A Merry Christmas to you, Bob Cratchit. Thank you, sir, and a Happy New Year to you as well. You're another fellow, my clerk, with 15 shillings a week and a wife and family talking about Merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam. I beg your pardon, sir, but is this Scrooge and Marley's? It is, sir. Well, then, I have the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley. Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at this present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the workhouses, are they still in operation? And the poor law are in full vigor then? They are still. I wish I could say they were not. A few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, of course. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Scrooge. And a merry Christmas to you. Bah! Humbug. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness outside thickened. The cold became intense. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used. It is only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. I shall, sir. Good night, Mr. Scrooge, and a Merry Christmas to you. Bah, humbug. 
Scrooge took his dinner in the usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. There, I have checked everywhere and found no one. Now, a small fire in the grate, a spoon and basin ready, the little saucepan of gruel, for I have a cold in my head. I must get closer to the fire. What's that? Who's there? Whoa! I, I know him. No, it can't be. It's humbug still. I won't believe it. How now? What do you want with me? Much. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? You're particular for a shank. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug. Ah! Mercy, dreadful apparition! Why do you trouble me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. Would you know the weight and length of your chain? It is a ponderous chain. Old Jacob Marley, tell me more. No rest, no peace. No! Captive bound and chain, do not regret your life as I do mine. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity and mercy were all my business. At this time of the rolling year I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned uh, but down? I never Hear me! My time is nearly gone. I will, but don't be hard upon me. I am here tonight to warn you that there is yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. You were always a good friend to me, thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? It is. I I, I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Uh, Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more. And look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. The apparition walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the specter reached it, it was wide open. The specter floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge closed the window quickly. He tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable. And, being from the emotion he had undergone, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed, without undressing, and fell asleep upon the instant. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the window from the walls. The chimes of a neighboring church struck the hour. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly. Was it a dream or not? He was resolved to lie awake until the hour was past, and considering that he could no more go to sleep than go to heaven, this was perhaps the wisest resolution in his power. The hour itself, and nothing else. Uh, Who draws back the curtains of my bed? Why, 
You look like a child, but so like an old man, with holly in your hand. But spring flowers trim your white dress. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. What business is it that brings you here? Your welfare. A night of unbroken rest would be more conductive to that end. Your reclamation, then. Take heed, rise, and walk with me. None out the window, spirit. I am mortal and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand upon your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Do you know where we are? Good heavens. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. Your lip is trembling, and what is that upon your cheek? Oh, spirit, lead me where you would. You recollect the way? Remember it. I could walk it blindfolded. There is the little market town in the distance with its bridge, its church, and winding river. And travelers come. And I know the names of every one. How they wish each other a merry Christmas as they pass. These are but shadows of the things that have been. They have no consciousness of us. But why are we here? The school is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his family, is left there still. There he sits, in the large house of broken fortunes. Mr. Scrooge, are you crying? It's me when I was young. Oh, poor boy, I I wish, but it's too late now. What is the matter? Nothing, nothing. It's my sister Fran! Fran! Oh, why does she not answer me? She cannot see you. I have come to bring you home, dear brother. Home for good and all. Home forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. We're to be together all the Christmases long and have the merriest time in all the world. Always a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered, but she had a large heart. So she had. You're right. She died a woman and had, as I think, children. One child. True, your nephew. Yes. It's all changed. We are in the city now, the way I remember from my youth. Do you know this place? Know it? I was apprenticed here. Why, it's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again. And Dick Wilkins, to be sure. Bless me, yes, there he is. Poor Dick, dear, dear. Oh, the parties we had in this office on Christmas Eve. Look at old Fezziwig and Miss Fezziwig go all through the dance. Those were happy times, spirit, and how very grateful we were to old Fezziwig for those Christmas Eves. A small matter to make these silly folk so full of gratitude, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that. It isn't that, spirit. He had the power to render us happy or unhappy. To make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil, the happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. What is the matter? Nothing in particular. Something, I think. No, no. I I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. My time grows short, quick. Oh, and now I am older. And you are not alone. It's Isabel. She was... No, please, spirit, I beg you. Do not make us stay here. She was what, Mr. Scrooge? She was my fiancée. Oh, how I loved her once. I pledged by every action would be for her. Please, spirit. You have changed. Listen. It matters little. To you, very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so. When it was made, you were another man. Your own feeling tells you that you were not what you are. I am that which promised happiness when we were one in heart, is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight no longer does. If this had never been between us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? No, I would gladly think otherwise if I could, heaven knows. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a girl with no dowry? You who weigh everything by gain. If you did choose me, do I not know that you would regret it? 
I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Spirits, show me no more. Why do you delight to torture me? Remove me. I cannot bear it. Leave me. Take me back. In the struggle, Scrooge observed that the light above the ghost's head was burning high and bright, and dimly connected that with its influence over him. Scrooge seized the extinguisher cap the ghost wore and pressed it down upon its head. The spirit dropped beneath it and disappeared. Scrooge was alone and conscious of being exhausted. Further, being in his own bedroom and barely had time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Scrooge heard the clock bell again hit the stroke of one. He felt that, it, that he was restored to consciousness in the nick of time for the purpose of holding a conference with the second messenger. He pulled every curtain aside with his own hands and established a sharp lookout all around the bed, for he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance. There is the hour, but I see... What?! It is my room, but it is transformed. The walls and ceiling are hung with living green and bright gleaming berries. I see holly, mistletoe, and ivory reflected in the light. A blaze roars in the chimney. Oh, oh my! Come in, come in, and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You have never seen the like of me before. Never. Have never walked forth with the younger members of my family? I am afraid I have not. But have you had many brothers, spirit? More than 1,800. Each time at this time of year, one of us visits this puny little planet to spread happiness and to remove as many as we can of the causes of human misery. Which is why I've come to see you, Ebenezer Scrooge. Will you come forth with me? I went forth last night on compulsions, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Phantom? I see you sprinkle drops from the torch which you hold above you upon those below. Is there a particular flavor in what you sprinkle from your torch? There is. My own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? To any kindly given. To a poor one most. Do you know this home, Ebenezer Scrooge? Why, it's Bob Cratchit's house. Aye, Bob Cratchit's home, which I bless with a sprinkling of my own torch. Think of that. Your clerk owes the opulence of his surroundings and the magnificence of his Christmas celebrations to the high principles and generous spirit of his employer. Cratchit, who has but 15 bob a week, yet the ghost of Christmas present blesses his four-roomed house. I want to look in the window. It will cost you nothing, which I'm sure will be good news to you. Will they be able to see me? No, which I'm sure will be good news for them. Listen! Peter! Belinda! And you two little ones. What has ever got your precious father then? And your brother, Tiny Tim? And Martha wanted as late last Christmas Day by half an hour. Here I am, Mother. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear Martha. How late you are. We had a deal of work to finish up last night and had to clear away this morning, Mother. Well, sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm Lord bless ye. No, no, your father's coming. Hide, Martha, hide. Why, where's our Martha? Not coming. Not coming? Not coming upon Christmas Day? Oh, I'm here, Father. Ah, oh, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> and how did little Tim behave? Oh, as good as gold and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind man see. All is ready, Father. Ah, the marriage of roast goose and sage and onion stuffing is one of the culinary masterpieces of our day. Even you little Cratchit shall be steeped in onion and sage to the eyebrows. Ah, the Christmas pudding. Is it all well? No one's stolen it, have they? Here it is. With Christmas Ollie stuck in the top. It is the greatest success you have achieved since our marriage, my dear. Well, I had some doubts about the quality of the flour. I'll hear nothing of it. It's perfect. It's time for toasts. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us. God bless us. Everyone! Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. Oh no, 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 kind spirit! Say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Oh, no, no, no. 
Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven, you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Listen. Mr. Scrooge, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, not for his. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. See how Tiny Tim drink it last of all? He doesn't care two pence if the name Scrooge is the ogre of the family. They are not a handsome family. They are not well dressed and they know the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they are happy, grateful, pleased with one another and contented with the time. God bless us. Everyone. Take hold of me, Ebenezer Scrooge. We continue on. There. Know you where we are? It is the home of my nephew. Listen. Hey, he said that Christmas was a humbug. As I live, he believed it too. Oh, oh more shame for him, Fred. She is so very pretty, as once my Isabel was. Here, he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He don't lose much of a dinner. <laughs> uh, indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner. Well, I'm very glad to hear it. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it if he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? We must go. Let us stay longer. One half hour, spirit. He has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, and it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. And I say, Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge. A Merry Christmas and a happy Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is. He wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it, nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge, see how they toast me. Spirit, why is your hair gray now? My time is almost at an end. Are spirits' lives so short? My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. I see something strange protruding from your skirts. Is it a foot or a claw? Oh, man. Look here. Look down here. There are two children. A boy and a girl. Spirit, are they yours? They are man's and they cling to me. Peeling from their fathers. This boy is ignorance. This girl is want. Beware them both and of all their degree. But most of all, beware this boy. For on his brow I see that which is written, which is doom. Have they no refuge or resource? Are there no prisons? <laughs> Are there no workhouses? Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. The third phantom now slowly approached, it was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmases yet to come. The spirit answered not, but pointed onward with its hand. You are about to show me shadows of the things that will have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. The upper portion of the garment was contracted for an instant in its fold, as if the spirit had inclined its head. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen, but as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear your company. The spirit's hand pointed straight before them. Lead on, lead on. The night is wearing fast. Lead on, spirit. They left the busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town. The whole quarter reeked with crime, with filth and misery. Look here, Joe. What have you got to sell? Off a minute's patience. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. No, indeed. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death instead of lying, gasping his last there alone by himself. It's the truest word that ever was spoke. It's a judgment on him. Open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Mm, a seal or two, a pencil case, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons. 
What do you call this? Bed cuttings? Hi, <laughs> bed cuttings. You don't mean to say you took them down, rings and all, with them lying there. Yes, I do. Don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. These blankets? Who else do you think? He isn't likely to take coal without him, I dare say. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> the spirit, I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. The spirit conducted him through several streets familiar to his feet. They entered Bob Cratchit's house and found the mother and children seated quietly round the fire. It must be near his time. Past it, rather. I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. But he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble. And there is your father at the door. Hello, Mother. Hello, children. You went to visit the grave? Yes, my dear. It would have done your art good to see how green a place it is. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. There was an extraordinary kindness of Mr. Scrooge's nephew, whom I met on the street today. And seeing that I looked a little, just a little down, you know, inquired what had happened to distress me. Said, I'm oddly sorry for it, Mr. Cratchit, and oddly sorry for your good wife. If I can be of service in any way, he said, giving me his card, that's where I live. Pray, come to me really seemed as if he had known our tiny Tim and felt with us. But however and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall none of us forget poor tiny Tim, shall we? Never, Father. And I know, I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was a little, little child, we shall not quarrel easily amongst ourselves and forget poor tiny Tim in doing it. Spectre, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. <laughs> The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him on. Then the spirit stopped. The hand was pointed elsewhere. They were before a graveyard, overrun by grass and weeds. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be? Or are they shadows of things that may be only? Say it is thus with what you show me. Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. There is the stone which covers this grave. Oh, I cannot look, but I must. It is my name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man who lay upon the bed? No spirit, oh no, no spirit. Hear me, I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been. Why show me this? If I am past all hope, assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing from this stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty. The spirit, stronger yet, repulsed him. Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrank, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, time before him was his own. To make amends in. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven the Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, oh, Jacob, on my knees. A Merry Christmas to everybody and a Happy New Year to all the world. Oh, hello, hello, oh, oh, there. Oh, hello, hello there. You, my boy, what's today? Today? Boy, it's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day? I haven't missed it. Yeah. Hello, my fine fellow. Do you know the butcher shop in the next street? But one at the corner? Uh, I should hope I did. Oh, an intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? What? The one you mean as big as me? Oh, what a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. Oh, it's hanging there now. It is. Go and buy it. Walker. No, no, I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here that I may give them the directions where to take it. <laughs> Look at him go. He's off like a shot. 
I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. He shall know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Sir! Here's the turkey. Why? It's impossible to carry that to Camden Town. You must take a cab. While shepherds watch their flocks by night, all seated on the ground, the angel of the Lord Stop here, cab driver. This is the house. Oh. Is your master at home, my dear? Yes, sir. We're in the dining room, sir. I- I'll show you upstairs if you please. Oh, that's all right. I'll go up right up, my dear. Fred! Who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let you in? In a mercy, Uncle. Welcome home. Yes, Uncle. Welcome home. Ah, it was a wonderful party with wonderful games and wonderful happiness. But Scrooge was early at the office the next morning. If he could only be the first and catch Bob Cratchit coming in late. A quarter after and no Bob Cratchit. I'd best keep my door wide open so that I might see him coming to the tank. Oh, here he comes. Hello. What do you mean by coming here this time of day? I am very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are, yes. I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I am not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer. And therefore... (laughs) And therefore, I am about to raise your salary... What? A Merry Christmas, Bob! A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family. Bob, make up the fires and buy more coal. Bless you, Mr. Scrooge. Ah, Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us. Everyone. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. This radio production of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol was written by Thomas Neely and produced by Mr. Neely with the Museum Theater Production Company of the Ohio Historical Society. Our cast included Ernie Rowland, Leanne Huber, Sandy Van Bremen, Scott Wilson, Nate Cockerell, Bob Ryber, Thomas Neely, and yours truly. John Well. Music was transcribed from the Ohio Village Singer. If you would like further information on radio creations and other activities connected with the Kilroy Was Here exhibit at the Ohio Historical Center, please call the Society or visit its website at ohiohistory.org.